I'd like to call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Um, before we begin the meeting, I'd just like to make an announcement that if you would like to speak um, either at the public hearing or during um, citizens' comments, there are cards in the foyer that you need to fill out and pr uh, provide to the clerk, and then we can call your name. So please do that if you would like to speak. May I please have a motion to certify the closed session? Madam Chair, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James C. County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Can I have a second? Second. We moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is a public hearing on the fiscal year 2020 20, uh, 29 capital improvement plan. I hereby open the public hearing and ask Ms. Hummel to please read the directions. Sorry, I need to get to that. Sorry. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, this is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker is allocated three minutes. Time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Ms. Ombi? Jay Iverson. I'm Jay Iverson, 103 Branscom Boulevard in the Berkeley District, represented by Mrs. Young. I'm here today to talk about the uh, $66.3 million proposed CIP for the next five years for an elementary school and a high school. Uh, first point I'd like to make is uh, all the literature that you have out there on future think, et cetera, an elementary school is defined as a ki kindergarten to fifth grade, middle school is six through eight, high school is nine through 12. I'll come back to that later. When considering uh, additional classroom capacity, there are two factors that go into that. One is the current capacity, uh, and second is your enrollment projections. I will stipulate that I have no quarrel at all with the current capacity numbers presented by the central office. They're reasonable, and I assume they're accurate. I do have a problem with the projections. Uh, is I have provided you some material. On number A, you will have the historical um, projections on um, elementary school, middle school, and high schools over the last five years. I can provide it all the way back to 2010 if you want. Uh, and when the future became present, every case, every case, they underprojected on the low enrollment the actual number of kids who showed up at the time in question. And for the last five years, the projections have been going down, not up. Now, specifically to the high schools, on the low enrollment projections in the current future think, the enrollment is projected to decline at the high school level for each of the next six years. And this is on the low enrollment projections. And the past has indicated that less kids show up than is projected. They're declining. They're not going up. And that's all verified in the material I gave you. Uh, even with these high school projections, in 10 years, they are below the effective capacity of the high schools. 
And uh, so I do not see how the 27 million, which is the difference between the, the middle, uh, the elementary school and 66 million, a uh, 27 million dollars can be at all justified to spend on any additional classroom space for the high schools. And on the elementary schools, uh, for the first time ever, you will see that they've included on the page, uh, it's, it's there in, in, in part B, they, um, enrollment projections include pre-K. Pre-K is jumping the numbers up. And even with that, 37 kids over the projections. Thank you, Mr. Everson. A million dollars per kid in capital cost. Thank you. Ms. Serza, could we sound an alarm at the next one? Thank you. Doesn't do an alarm. Does it blink for them? Thank you. Oh, okay. There are no other, no other speaker cards, so I close the public hearing. Okay. The next item on the agenda is Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to ask... Uh, Thank you, sorry. The next item on the agenda is Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to invite uh, Jamestown High School junior Jack DeVore up to lead us, please. Jack, thank you so much. Come to the microphone and lead us whenever you're ready. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jack. Ms. Sozer, will you take attendance, please? Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Mr. Kelly, can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move up for approval of the agenda with a slight modification to move 11.01 .01 New Horizons presentation on educational services to just after citizens' comments. Can I have a second, please? Second. It's been moved and uh, seconded to approve the agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serzer, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. <coughs> Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Okay. That brings us to announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. Good evening, Madam Chair. I'm excited this evening to share with you two new ways for parents and families to receive important and helpful information about WJCC schools. Beginning December 12th, families and staff will be able to sign up to receive text messages from the school division. We've heard from many people that text is the easiest way for them to receive notifications about school closures or other emergency messages. In response, we are happy to make this service available to families. Signing up is simple. Any cell phone number currently in our rapid notification system will be sent a text message on December 12th. Recipients simply need to respond confirming that they wish to receive texts Families who do not have a cell phone number on file will be emailed instructions for signing up. As you imagine, this will be a valuable communications tool during severe times of winter weather. And speaking of valuable resources, I want to let you know about a new Parent Academy resource for families. We know, know that in today's busy, overscheduled world, it can be challenging for parents to map out family activities or develop strategies that support their children's learning. Fortunately, the WJC School's Parent Academy is here to help. Every day at noon, we post a Parent Academy e-tip on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with information about academic support, family conversation starters, or activities parents can try with their children. I'd like to encourage you to visit our social media pages to see a few of the e-tips for yourself. One of my particular favorites suggested that elementary school children practice their writing skills by pretending to be the family reporter. The tip recommended that the child use his imagination and observation skills to report on neighborhood events of the day. Now that is pretty creative. By the way, each Parent Academy e-tip is available in both English and Spanish. Goal three of our strategic plan, Elevate Beyond Excellence, 
is to cultivate a culture of open and effective communication to inform and engage all stakeholders. Text messaging and Parent, parent Academy e-tips are two ways to do just that. Madam Chair, that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Anyone else? Okay. The next item on our agenda is student and staff recognitions. Dr. Heron? Thank you, Madam Chair. We have several individuals to recognize tonight. Let's begin by honoring Jamestown's golf team for being named VHSL Class 4 Champions. The team shot a season best 291 at Williamsburg National Golf Course to earn the title. Students, as your name is called, please join us up front to be recognized and remain for a group photograph. Dana Abron. Casey Bennett. <laughs> Fletcher Chisman. <laughs> Broderick Clavel. <laughs> John DeVore. Robert Judek. Mason Eggleston. William Graham. Austin Hitt. Logan Hitt. <laughs> Michaela Huish. <laughs> Emily Johnson. <laughs> Zachary Loudermilk. Denver Moore, <laughs> Aidan Muller, <laughs> and Gunter Muller. Coach would come up and join us as well, please. Half of you down here. Congratulations. Congratulations again. We also want to recognize J. Blaine Blayton for being named a Purple Star School by the Virginia Department of Education and the Virginia Council on the Interstate Compact for Military Children. JBB Elementary is one of the first schools in Virginia to earn the honor for its efforts to support students from military families. During tonight's school spotlight, you will have a chance to hear more about the programs and resources that JBB Elementary School offers to help ease transitions for military families and to help them cope with unique challenges like deployments. Principal Amy Stamm and the team have joined us up front to be recognized. Well done. Keep up the outstanding work.
Madam Chair, those were all of the recognitions for this evening. We, look, we will have more recognitions at the regular meeting in January. The next item on our, on our agenda is School Spotlight, and I think we're going to hear about Jay Blade Blayton and the, the, the award they were just recognized for. So. <laughs> That's correct. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Tonight's School Spotlight shines on Jay Blaine Blayton Elementary School. As you know, goal four of the division's strategic plan, Elevate Beyond Excellence, calls on all WJC staff to build a positive and inclusive culture that inspires all students to participate fully in their school experience. In part, that means identifying the, un the unique needs of each child or group of children in our schools and working to meet those needs while also removing barriers to their engagement and success. The teachers and staff at JBB Elementary do a great job in that regard. As you just heard during our recognitions, our school was named a 2018 Purple Star School by the Virginia Council of, on the Interstate Compact for Military Children for its work to support children from military families. This evening, we are proud to welcome the JBB principal, Dr. Amy Stamm, and members of her team to share a few examples of their work. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Certainly, our students from military families face unique challenges. For example, research shows that students that our children of military families move six to nine times between kindergarten and graduation from high school. That means they are starting a new school, making new friends, forming new relationships with adults about three times more than students of non-military peers. These constant changes can lead to social and emotional and academic challenges. At JBB, we have 65 students, which is about 15% of our population, that comes from at least one parent who, has, who is an active duty member of the military. Our school counselor, our teachers, and all of our staff really do an amazing job of helping our students transition in and out of our school, ensuring that the children are placed in the appropriate classes and getting the appropriate remediation, academic support, and intervention and enrichment that they deserve. But as you can imagine, we need to focus on providing them with emotional support for these young people as well. Leading much of that work are our fabulous school counselor, Lynette Carpenter, our assistant principal, Sandy Van Lelleveld, our CRT teacher, Jennifer Kimbrough, and they are all here with me tonight. Um, as a team, we work with our staff to help new students make connections with their classmates and teachers. We have social clubs for military children along with special activities throughout the year highlighting the importance of our military families, parents, and the sacrifices of both the, the service members and their families. We have a short video to share with you this evening that highlights some of those activities. The military soldiers. We have a military social at JBB when <laughs> she gets tired of holding this smile. The <laughs> <laughs> great place for for Miss Kimbro to have her face face stopped. It's beautiful. <laughs> Every year we have a military social at JBB when it started four years ago when I started here. Having, being part of a military family, it was really important for me to share that experience with our kids so that our students, which there's about 65 military students at JBB, so they know the connection of other military families within the school because when you're not around your family, you need that support. I decided to volunteer for military kids because my, I myself was a military kid actually and having that foundation and friends and support I think is really great of what they're doing here at JB Blaine. In the spring, we'll hold a Purple Up Day. It's done nationwide. Everyone wears purple for support of our military students. And we usually get a group shot of at least the staff wearing purple, but all the students support it. I think these programs are really important because it shows that there's a big community that military children have to support them. Um, that there's people who have gone before them that have experienced the same kind of things that they have. Uh, all the moving and, and the stress with their parents being deployed or um, things like that. It's important, I think, for, for kids to know that they have some help on the other side of things. So. 
I did send home a survey with, for military kids. One, I wanted to see where they were born. That was the map, and I've been wanting to do that, so I sent it out a couple weeks ago, so I had time to take pictures, create my map, but just to see how they felt their kids responded to the military, I asked for four words. And so on the I'm a military kid sheet, the bigger the words, the more it was brought up by the parents. So funny, smart, caring were all really big ones. So how JBB works with military students, um, we have a mentor program that we do, um, and it's staff members get paired up with kids that they kind of are starting to build a rapport with already, and then they do little check-ins each week. And so a lot of our military kids are involved in that program, um, and it's just really great for especially the new kids that come in that are in the military for them to have an extra person that's kind of a little cheerleader for them and um, helping them along and letting them know like hey if you need anything we're here for you. Our PTA also gets involved with our military students. Um, they are participants in our Big B mentor program and so they're paired up with some of our kids as well and helping them feel safe and welcomed at the school. I love our Veterans Day program. We invite parents, we invite people in the community. A lot of people get involved and it's a lot of like our military and then retired military that come in. Um, we all the students will sing different songs from the different um, military branches and it gets really emotional like you have people standing up when you when they hear their song and um, it's just it's a lot of patriotic pride and excitement so I love it it's one of my favorite programs that we do I think it's really important to connect military kids when they're in the school because you don't know how long they're going to be in the school and you want to make sure that you develop those connections with them right away just in case they aren't here for more than two years because um, you want them to have a home base and to feel safe. Um, and developing that safety right away is really crucial to helping them succeed when they're in your building. Thank you. When we started our military social four years ago, we could fit parents and children in one classroom and now we're using over half of the cafeteria to house them all and, and have the activities we have. So it's really grown and it's pretty impressive to see. Um, everyone at JBB is so proud of being one of the first Purple Star schools. As you heard in the recognition segment, Mrs. Carpenter took part in special training and she serves as our primary point of contact for our military families. Ms. Kimbrough was our point of contact for making sure all of our resources are on our website that families have right um, at their fingertip access points to all military family resources. Um, and every teacher, assistant, administrator, custodian, cafeteria staff member, and bus driver are committed to building relationships with our students and to giving them the resources that they need to be successful. We hope tonight's spotlight gives you a good sense of how we uh, accomplished that. And we would also like you to come visit us at any time and to see firsthand all the wonderful things that are happening at our school every day. Um, it really is something to be proud of, and we are. In the meantime, our team is happy to answer any questions that you have for us. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'm assuming that you have something to say because this is near and dear oh, to your I, heart. I love being at your school. That was wonderful. They were practicing for the program that day. But uh, I taught in a military school, and I don't know if you know that. And so uh, the transitions, the deployments, they have a huge impact upon families. So recognizing those stressors upon children is extremely important, and I applaud you for doing this. So thank you. I had a question about, I noticed you have the William & Mary ROTC uh, candidates, and uh, I just, they were all Army, so is it primarily the Army ROTC program at? Um, my husband used to be the professor of military Got science. It. I was trying to make William that connection. Okay. Um, he has since retired from the military, but we still have the connection with the cadets, so that's the connection I have and asked them. They've come a couple of times to come help. Um, and it just brings another connection to the kids and to our community. That's great. I loved seeing the college students interacting with the elementary school kids. Yeah, that was really powerful. And um, some of our children that are very shy and introverted really got excited making connections with them. And the other really cool thing that Ms. Kimber did that she's very modest about in doing that survey is she purposefully made sure that all students had a connection sitting at the table. So whether they were born in Hawaii or over in Germany or locally, they, they had a connection, something that they had a talking point could stem off of, which was really powerful for them. 
Dr. Kelly. Dr. Stam, thank you for uh, coming tonight and, and printing this, and congratulations on your award. I really think Blayton is a, is a great example for the rest of our division to, to emulate and, and how we treat our military kids, because I think it's not only a great program for the military kids, but I think it's a great program for their parents as well to understand that their kids' you know, special needs are going to be met um, and, and, and acknowledged, and I think, that's, I think that's a great thing. And I think it's also good for the rest of the population, too, or our student population to interact with the military and, and, and get to know those, those folks, I think. So I, I really congratulate you and appreciate you coming forward and let us and tell us about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for coming this evening and for your work. I think I'd like to echo Mr. Kelly's comment that you set an example for the rest of the division, but also for the state. Your designation really, um, I think, is a shining example of what, of what we can do. And, and I, I hope you continue the work, and I look forward to hearing about the next things that you're doing to further this work. Thank you. All right, thank and we will proudly um, display our resolution and our medallion. Is that a medallion? Um, coin at, at um, NJBB, we're going to put it in a nice special case. So, And we get to have it for the next three years. That's wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations. Well, when we come visit, we, we'll come, yeah, come check on. it out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is citizens' comments. Ms. Hummel. Hey. You just heard from me, but you're going to hear from me again because this is the only important job the parliamentarian has. So um, this... This is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker is allocated three minutes. Time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. I believe we have one speaker card. Ms. Ownby. Kim Hunley. And I didn't even need to say the <laughs> Good evening, Kim Hundley, proud president of the Teachers Association. And very thankful. I love the spotlight because I count my blessings for working here and name them one by one. So as far as CIP and the budget, um, I know that my exec committee, we'd like to be included again with um, your retreat that you have, the budget retreat. Um, we'd like to stay involved. Um, the hardest unit I have to teach in kindergarten is the wants and needs unit, which comes up in December. <laughs> it is so hard because we want a lot of things, but we need certain things. And so for you all, it's going to be a wants and needs assessment. I know as a parent, when you get those Christmas lists, I struggled. Okay, my son needs tennis shoes, so I have to get my daughter tennis shoes. If I'm going to spend this much on my son, I have to spend this much on my daughter. Try to make it all equitable and equal. And really what I needed to do was, what does he need? And does he really need that or does he want that? And so that's one thing you have to look at, and I know that's, that's something that you will do. Um, a lot of things are going to come. Um, again, the equity issue will be up. Again, you have to, to look at it as what's needed. And a lot of times I remember my parents would do this. Um, okay, if you need that and you get that, then what are you willing to give up? Because <laughs> if you get that, these are the things you might not receive that's a big ticket item. So those are just things to think about. Um, we look forward to um, being with you throughout the budget process. And um, everybody wants everything, but let's focus on what really needs to elevate us to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I'm going, I have to scoot out. I hate to apologize. But the reading council, is, they're going over their book lists. There are a lot of books Oh, I want for um, my classroom, but there's only a few I probably need. So, but yes, the snacks, those are the blessing snacks. They just, if you just read that, it's just it's things we need to focus on, how thankful we really are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunley. All right. The next thing on the agenda is the New Horizons presentation on educational services. Dr. Heron and Mr. Kelly, would you, Mr. Kelly serves as the chair of the New Horizons board. Vice chair. Oh, vice chair, but close. Oh, vice chair. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I promoted you. That's uh, a. 
Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Casey Roberts, who is the new director of the New Horizons Regional Education Center. Uh, Mr. Casey Roberts started his career in public education in 2006 with Hampton City Schools and held, held a variety of positions, including that of classroom teacher, many administrative and leadership positions, high school assistant principal, and high school principal. Most recently, he served as the principal of Smithfield High School with Olive Waite from 2015 to 2018. Mr. Roberts completed his undergraduate studies at Virginia Tech. The Hokies. <laughs> as a member of the Corps of Cadets, I as I recall. Correct. Um, and holds a Master of Education in Curriculum and Instruction with, em with an emphasis in teacher leadership from Regent University. He also holds an Education Specialist degree in Educational Leadership and Administration and is currently completing his Doctorate in Educational Administration and Policy Studies from the George Washington University. I, um, I want to thank my uh, fellow board members for, uh, for uh, modifying the agenda because Mr. Casey is also a new parent. Of a 12-week old 12, boy. That's, and I think it's your second? It's my second. So he has a 12-week-old at home and uh, needs to get there for mom. And I'm so. driving to Chesapeake, so, <laughs> so thank so, you. So uh, my pleasure to introduce Mr. Roberts. Thank, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, um, Dr. Heron, and school board members, thank you so much for having me this evening, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm excited about uh, the work that we're doing at New Horizons, and I will be giving you a brief overview of the work that we're doing in addition to the partnership we have with Williamsburg, James City County. So our slogan for this year and for many years to come is boldly going beyond the horizon. So if you think of Star Trek to boldly go, that is something that we are doing at New Horizons. Um, at New Horizons, uh, we like to illuminate minds, ignite passions, and shape futures. And our mission is to train and educate a world-class workforce with our career and technical education programs. Uh, we also want to train and educate um, future scientists and math, uh, mathematicians with our Governor's School for Science and Technology, and also provide effective uh, therapeutic and vocational treatment for students and youth with disabilities with our Center for Autism and Newport Academy. So we have a regional footprint at New Horizons. We are owned and operated by the six Peninsula School Divisions, Hampton, Newport News, York County, Gloucester, Warrensburg, James City County, York County, Newport News. Uh, we were established in 1965 as the Virginia Peninsula Vocational Technical Education Center, so we've been around for over 50 years. We are the largest and oldest regional program in the Commonwealth of Virginia. There are nine other regional programs, and we hold the largest and, and oldest title. Uh, we're multi-campus. We have five campuses currently. We have a Butler Farm campus, which houses our career and technical education and Governor's School for Science and Technology um, in Hampton. Woodside Lane campus holds two buildings, one for career and technical education and one for the Center of Autism and Newport Academy, the 9 through 12 programs. We have a wing at Yorktown Middle School that houses our 6 through 8 Center of Autism program and a wing in Kill Creek Elementary Newport News that houses our K-5 um, Center for Autism program. We have over 300 employees full, full and part-time, and our budget exceeds $19 million. And we serve annually 1,500 students across the peninsula and 1,200 adults per year. So New Horizons is more than just career and technical education. If you look up on the screen, we are New Horizons. We have eight different divisions that fall under the umbrella of New Horizons. Uh, we have career and tech, we have the Governor's School, we have the Center for Apprenticeship and Adult Training, the Youth Workforce, a Family Counseling Center out of the College of William & Mary, um, the Advanced Technical Careers Academy, Newport Academy, and Center for Autism. So. Um, a lot of the community understanding of New Horizons is that we provide a lot of career and technical education, but we go well beyond that um, in different service areas. So currently we serve 1,044 students in our career and technical education programs from the six school divisions. We serve 23 high schools um, that feed into our career and technical education programs. We offer 25 current tech course offerings. And we have an 87% pass rate when it comes to national credentialing for those students going through our programs. 81% of second, first year students come back for a second year of study, and most of our courses are one year studies. So students will come in, take electrical for one year, come back, and possibly take HVAC. So they're, they're leaving with dual credits um, and dual um, credentialing when they leave and graduate from their home school. We also have the Advanced Technical Careers Academy, which is a transition to employment program, and it is a public-private pri public partnership with 40 different companies in our area that are offering jobs to students before they leave high school. 
Here's our five-year plan. We started this five-year plan in 2015. We are currently in year four of the five-year plan, um, 2018, 2019, and many of the items in this five-year plan we have accomplished already. There's a lot of work still to be done, um, but we are making headway with our five-year plan to make career and technical education um, a viable option for all students across the peninsula. So here's our course offerings at both campuses, Butler Farm and Woodside Lane. Most of our construction technology courses are located at the Woodside Lane, which is located in Newport News. But we offer everything from auto tech to veterinary science to fire science, cosmetology, Cisco networking, cybersecurity. We run the gambit of uh, CT offerings. Um, and we're looking to add more because a lot of our students are looking at those options as possible career opportunities uh, when they leave high school. Our um, Advanced Technical Careers Academy, the Good Life Solution, is the partnership we have with 40 different companies where they have come in and is an employer-driven um, academy where 140 students across the peninsula are trained for employability um, and they are looking for specific jobs in automotive construction and manufacturing. Uh, we have a signature signing day. Um, most high schools have signing days for students that get full rides to colleges for athletics or academics. We hold a signing day similar to that event for students that are accepting um, contracts from uh, companies such as Lee Bear or Newport New Shipbuilding, um, or Jordan or Continental. So these students are receiving um, salaries in excess of forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 straight out of high school with no debt. Um, and we're not saying no to college for these students. We're saying, these students are saying we'd rather go to work and allow these companies to pay for their college education. So this is a, this is a huge viable source for all, opportunity for all students. Our governor and our governor's school for science and technology currently serves 176 students, and we are the state gifted high school program on the peninsula. Uh, we offer three um, research strands, and one in engineering, biological sciences, computational sciences. And through these three strands, students can choose an assortment of coursework that is also dual enrolled. Students leave on average from the governor's school for science and technology with 20 to 40. Uh, dual enrolled credits from Thomas Nelson. So they can walk in to any of the top tier universities with those, uh, those credit hours and be ahead of their peers. And most of these students go to the top tier universities, the Virginia Techs, the UVAs, the MITs, Harvard, Yale, Stanford. Those are the top tier students that are going to those from this program. Our Center for Autism serves 134 students from across the peninsula. And these students specifically have been um, diagnosed with um, autism or autistic um, disability. The program of the Center for Autism and Newport Academy is to provide students with the skills needed to return to their school, their home school. It's not the goal of this program to keep them um, at this program, but to give them the skills necessary to <coughs> to be successful um, at their home school. Students are engaged in workplace um, placement programs with the U.S. Navy and other local sponsors. And if you see from this photo here, one of those students received a commander's coin from the commander of Defense Logistics Agency uh, for his work he was doing at the commissary from Rear Admiral Harris, I believe. So um, our students are getting awards from top tier people in our community, and that's powerful. Newport Academy serves 95 students from across the peninsula. and, the, and specifically service students with emotional disabilities and intellectual disabilities. Uh, again, the goal is to uh, provide skills and training to those students so they can return to their home schools. Um, in those pictures located on the screen, um, they recently held a scholastic book fair, and the students raised enough money to purchase interest books for the media center. It was a very exciting time. The students are very excited about their book fair, and these are the powerful things that are happening at Newport Academy. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of our partnership, specifically um, dealing with Williamsburg, James City County. So currently, right now, we are serving 92 of your high school students um, in an assortment of, of career clusters at New Horizons with Career in Tech. Um, the largest uh, career cluster that your students um, like to attend is construction technology. And that was, those courses are located at the Woodside Lane campus in Newport News. But we also have students that are also in engineering technology, automotive, information technology, public service, health sciences. Here's a success story from one of, uh, of your students from Jamestown High School, Mason Kolda. He is, um, was in the program for HVAC, which is located at the Woodside Lane campus. He, learned, he earned those certifications while he was um, 
at New Horizons, and he was one of the first graduates of the ATC Academy. He was offered full-time employment with Newport New Shipbuilding prior, before he graduated, and that's his picture right there receiving a hat and the contract from one of the directors at Newport New Shipbuilding. Another success story is Thomas Ludwig from Jamestown High School. He was in a fire science program. He was a recipient of an honorarium of $1,000. Um, he earned certifications um, for fire science and is currently enrolled at Thomas Nelson, um, finishing up his e EMT certification. Um, and currently he is applying, he has applied and is in the interview process for James City County Fire Department. For our Governor's School for Science and Technology, we serve 29 students from Williamsburg James City County this year. Um, and you can see that it's pretty much a, an even spread between um, computational science, engineering, and biological sciences. So uh, you are sending a, a large cohort to our programs, which is um, very promising. A success story, um, most recently, um, November 9th through 10th, um, three, uh, Williamsburg, James City County, out of a group of five, uh, competed in the Harvard MIT Mathematics Tournament. And this is an international tournament uh, where you have math teams from around the world that are competing for um, mathematic genius competition. <laughs> um, they placed 70 out of 200 teams. So I don't, that is huge. Um, and we have very, very intelligent students across the board in all of our um, our programs, but this is definitely one that I wanted to highlight. Wesley Whitehurst is from Warhill High School. He participated in the research mentorship aspect. So as students matriculate through the program of studying in the Governor's School for Science and Technology in the three strands, they also have a research mentorship component. So these students are coupled <coughs> with um, scientists at local universities, Jefferson Lab, that are doing live research and they conduct research with those scientists. So this is one of your own. He conducted uh, research with an associate professor from College of William & Mary and he's actually published and will be presenting his, co-authoring his research with this professor in Colorado. He already presented it in, in July. And I cannot pronounce all those words under <laughs> um, his title, the title of his uh, study. However, this is huge to have to be published with a scientist before you get your high school diploma. That's powerful. For the Center of Autism, we currently serve eight students. At Newport Academy, um, we currently serve six this year. But as you can see, you can see the five-year spread um, that we are um, getting kids to go back to their home schools um, to be successful there. Um, and between the intellectually disabled program, you have three students and three students in the EDID program. So it's an even split right now. So what's on the horizon for New Horizons? We are undergoing a rebranding of our story. We are New Horizons and we really want to um, get out into the community to put New Horizons on the map and to let parents and students know that this is a viable option for all students. We want to um, not discourage students from going to college per se, but to say that this is also a viable option if you are interested um, in career in tech. Um, we also have expanded career and technical course offerings. We're going to be offering plumbing and pipe fitting starting next year. Um, and we're offering a two-year Cisco Academy. Currently, our Cisco Academy is one year, so students can receive the Cisco Academy Technician Certification. With a second year, they can also get the certification for the anal analyst level, so it'll be level two Cisco. We're also going to be holding community days where we're going to be inviting you and other school boards to come to New Horizons to actually see the work that we do, not just hear it from me and see pictures, um, but actually experience it um, with students um, in the spring. So. Be on the lookout for your invitations. We would love to have you. Uh, we're also having school division days where we're going to be inviting the division leadership and the building leadership principals and school counselors to come shadow students and to experience the career and technical education learning that's going on there to better able to recruit students from high school to, to say this is a viable option uh, that we wanted to put in front of you. So boldly going beyond the horizons, we are a dynamic and diverse organization that's committed to illuminating minds, igniting passions and shaping futures for all students. We are making a global impact with graduates who are prepared and motivated for life, college, and the 21st, work for, 21st century workforce. And we are pushing the limits of learning, experience, and self-discovery. New Horizons is op also opening doors to unlim unlimited opportunities, as you can tell from our students that are receiving contracts from um, those big companies um, that need our students to fill those positions. And we want students to look at New Horizons as a viable option. 
and to think start your future early at New Horizons. That concludes my presentation. I kind of zipped right through it. There's obviously more to New Horizons, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Kelly? So, Madam Chair, um, I was privileged to sit on the, on the interview process for Mr. Roberts, and uh, I hope you all see what I see, was, was, which was his excitement, his energy, and his visions for New Horizons, and I look forward to working with him as uh, we go forward to, uh, to take it to new heights. Dr. Heron, before I toss it to school board members, as a superintendent uh, member of, of, of that uh, committee, I don't, do you have anything to add about we work very closely with Mr. Roberts and enjoy meeting with him before every board meeting. And he's really come out and, and sat down with uh, a group of our staff to really start to create the vision for the future. We really appreciate being involved in that conversation with you, Mr. Roberts, and look forward to working with you more this year. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Heron. Mrs. Young? Yes. Hi. Um, I love what New Horizons does for kids, and but I have a question. It's not about the kids so much. It's the Center for Apprenticeship and Adult Training. Can you expound a little bit about what that center does? Because yes. we do have adults that probably could benefit from that. Absolutely. So the Center for Adult Training and Apprenticeships is the adult component for New Horizons. We provide training um, in Votech Voltec education to get certified to the journeyman level when it comes to HVAC or electrical. Um, and we serve over 1,200 uh, adult learners, and we have employers that send their employees to the center to get certified. So they work during the day, they come to us at night to get certified, so they're working to get certified, and then once they become certified, um, they, they gain um, more salary benefits through the company. So it is a, is a, a partnership with um, employers um, to train their um, employees. <laughs> Just one more question, and what are the age, what's the age span for that program? It can range anywhere from 18 to upper 40s. We're talking about it. We do have some, some um, students that are retooling from different industries. They want to get into plumbing or HVAC or uh, electrical, and they're retooling, and they come upwards to 40 years old plus. There may be even be some 50-year-olds that are retooling. So it expands the gambit of the adult working age range. Okay, thank you. But I know as a plumber, I was looking at that. I'm kind of excited about that because um, I recently had a lovely experience with a plumber. For three hours work, $500. Correct. So many of us are in the wrong profession. That's all I can say. <laughs> there are some master plumbers that are making more than over $100,000 plus. Yes. Um, we had a plumber out at our house for 15 minutes for $400. So you got a good deal. <laughs> um, so with the new portrait of a Virginia graduate and the new emphasis that we have on career tech, um, as a school board member, I want to see as many students as we can possibly that are interested take advantage of what New Horizons has to offer. And I know we have some um, just kind of uh, miles between us that create um, issues uh, as far as just students having to get up really early in the morning. And um, so anyway, I, what is your vision in the next, or do you see like in the next five to 10 years if we really can do what we want, which is expand by three or four times what we're doing right now, do you see in, uh, that vision happening amongst, because I'm sure our school division isn't the only one thinking this. So do you see New Horizons just like growing and growing and growing or? I, I see New Horizons growing as far as how many students we can serve, not necessarily the, the physical footprint of New Horizons, more buildings and, and that sort of thing, uh, with the, the expansion of hybrid courses. Online courses, we're really, um, we're really partnering with corporations that are interested in, in engaging in that type of dialogue about having online courses with content, dealing with career and tech that students can do from their home school and possibly um, do a, a work study, but it's not every day. It could be once a week or once every two weeks. 
Um, so in, in the future, I see, you know, not us expanding our physical footprint, but expanding the opportunities as far as hybrid courses, online courses for career and tech to get those credentials. Thanks. Yes, I have three questions building on Ms. Hummel's comments. So last year, didn't, didn't we flip the time of day that our students are able to participate in New Horizons from early morning to afternoon? My understanding is that Williamsburg James City County comes in PM, the PM session. This year. That's correct. Correct. Um, we are, some of our courses um, are one session of the day, and we're looking to expand them to PM as well. Um, like Mechatronics. Mechatronics is offered to Thomas Nelson. They can get 22 dual enrolled credit hours, um, but it's only offered in the morning. Next year, we're expanding it to PM, so students on the northern end of the uh, peninsula could come down to take uh, Mechatronics at the Hampton campus. And so, building on that, the Gov School didn't switch. That's still early in the morning if you want to participate in Gov School. Is that correct? I would, have to, I would have to check that for all, all of the Williamsburg James City County students, but I believe it's AM. Okay. And you may not be able to answer this question, but I was just kind of looking for a ballpark. For the students who participate in Gov School, on average, how many college credits do they exit with when they graduate? It, it, sometimes it ranges. It depends on what's, what's their course of study, um, between 20 and 40 dual enrolled credit hours. That's huge. That's Correct. huge. Um, and then I had one other question. So you, uh, this current year you're serving 92 WJCC students. What is our maximum capacity? How many slots does WJCC have? Each division doesn't have a, set, a certain amount of slots. They send applications, applications are screened, and then we accept um, uh, students to have their, their criteria to, to, that meets the, the course criteria. Um, right now we are at capacity. We have t uh, 1,062 seats and we're at 1,044. So if you could help me as we go into the budget season understand. So it's my understanding with the amount of money that we budget to go towards the regional partnership that funds New Horizon, we do get X amount of slots. Is, is that well, it's true? based on a three-year average of your enrollment. So back to your enrollment. You can see the enrollment for current tech. So as you can see, the current tech, your three-year average would be 18, 19, 17, 18, 16, 17. So an average of those three numbers would determine your tuition rate for Williamsburg James City County. So the more students you send, your tuition goes up. The less students you send, your tuition goes down. That's just for career and tech. So there's different formulas for the different, different um, departments within New Horizons. So what's the formula for Gov School? The Gov School is based on total credit hours that students are receiving. It's very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But it works. It works. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? Mr. Roberts, we're really grateful that you came up uh, this evening to share uh, your uh, information with us, and I look forward to the invitation to come down and visit uh, and, have, and, and have an opportunity to spend some time Absolutely. down there. So thank you very much. Thank you much. so much. All right. Safe travels home. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That brings us to the consent agenda. Um, approval of minutes from the, from the October 16th and the November 13th meetings, financial report and monthly bills and payroll for October 2018, personnel actions as presented, revised policy EBB threat assessment teams, revised policy JEA school attendance, retire policy JHF, JHFA student safety supervision of students, and retire policy JOA assess, uh, access rather to student records. Uh, can I have a motion, please? Madam yeah. Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda as proposed. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Young. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. All right, the consent agenda has been... Approved. Um, the next item is award a contract for invitation for bid number 19-13530, Cooley Field Renovations. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we award a contract for invitation for bid number 19-13530, Cooley Field Renovations to Homeland Contracting Corporation in the amount of $288,484. Thank you. Can I have a second? Second. It's moved and seconded. Any questions for staff or any updates from staff? Dr. Heron? Anything to add? 
the bid information has been added to, to the agenda item and that you've got the award of the bid from that. Okay. Any questions about the bid or the project in general? Yep. Yep. Um, so, I, thank you, Mr. Snipes. I appreciate you taking the hint there. Um, I noticed in the, in the tabulation for a bid, the, uh, the low bid is uh, relatively extremely low. Um, are we concerned about that? No, we are not concerned about it. The uh, we used homeland the county has used homeland reputable vendor. Okay, all right. I was just I was just sometimes nothing more expensive than the lowest bidder. So just con I was just concerned. Thank you. Anything else? All right, Ms. Serzer, will you call the roll, please? Mm -hmm. Ms. Hummel, aye. Mr. Kelly, aye. Ms. Ownby, aye. Mrs. Taylor, aye. Mrs. Young, aye. Ms. Cook, aye. That motion passes. The next is approve resolution R1918 codification of guidelines for discussion, consideration, and decision for additional school capacity and growth. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move we approve resolution R19 18 codification of guidelines for discussion, consideration, and decision for additional school capacity and growth. Thank you. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you. All right. Before I um, toss this for discussion, I just wanted to mention a couple things. So this is um, a, a topic that came through the liaison uh, committee, uh, which includes uh, all three jurisdictions, both, uh, both localities and the school division, um, to talk about how to ha come to a common understanding of when it's appropriate for the school division to work with the localities to discuss uh, building or, or somehow adding additional educational space and what kind of uh, points, milestones at which those discussions should happen. I, I want to be clear that this doesn't um, apply to today. Today uh, we are above those thresholds and, and, and that's reflected in Dr. Heron's CIP recommendation to us, which is before us and will be discussed later on in this meeting, um, but rather to come to a common agreement uh, for the future. And so with that, if this is adopted today, I then will forward it to the, the mayor of the city and the chair of the board of supervisors for their consideration and ask that they put it on their agenda for adoption as well. So with that, Anyone has any comments or questions? Do I don't know, Dr. Heron, do you have anything to add? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay, hearing, hearing none, Ms. Serza? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. The next uh, item on the agenda is the fiscal year 2020-2029 capital improvement plan discussion. Um, just a reminder, we're discussing this um, today and then it'll be on the next agenda for discussion and then adoption. Um, and so uh, that the plan is then for us to adopt in December and forward our request to the localities. This is still a relatively new timeline for us. We used to adopt the CIP at the same time that we adopted our operating budget, but because this allows uh, the opportunity for the localities to build this into their budgets, we, we shifted to the fall or the latter part of, of, of the year uh, to allow better planning for um, with the localities in their, in their capital budgets. So. With that, uh, Dr. Heron, do you have anything you'd like to start with? Uh, just to uh, remind the board, we've just presented, Dr. Murphy presented some additional uh, updated research on school size, and you have that in front of you this evening, uh, just as a reference point. And um, that's really the only new information this evening. We also provided some questions uh, following the last board meeting's discussion of the capital improvement plan. That. Does anyone have anything they'd like to um, comment on or ask staff about with regard to this CIP uh, proposal from Dr. Heron? Just a quick question. Um, is there any ranking of this, of these items? So if they're in, they're all ranked one, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Just as a point of reference, Madam Chair, as well, the uh, Board of Supervisors have not approved the end of year spending plan, so those items still, those items that were CIP items in that end of year plan are still in the CIP at this moment in time. 
So I have uh, some questions, uh, and these are questions I think that we've discussed before, but just for the purposes of, you know, maybe if someone's just tuned in for the first time, um, I actually have kind of four topics I'd like to talk about. One is the accuracy of future thinks uh, projections. Other is kind of the logic behind 85% and 90% capacity and why, why those things, you know, are, are important, why we don't go to, you know, 100, 110% capacity. Um, for educational purposes, and then I'd also t like to talk a little bit about, kind of remind the public about the thinking behind the recommendation for a new elementary, and then also high school space, because those are the big ticket items. So if I could start with the accuracy of future thinking, if we could just um, talk about that, just, it, you don't have to bring up, you know, specific percentages, but it's been, if you could just affirm that, historically it's been very close, if you could do that from the microphone response, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, for the last eight years, it's been within 1%, the low projection. Of the low projections. Yes, so. ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, so just in terms of the community understanding, you know, where we are in terms of our elementary and high school buildings across the, across the elementary schools and across the high schools being at the capacity that they are, could you talk a little bit about the need Dr. Heron, to have why you don't want to be exactly 100% full or 110% full, why 85% why is, is really ideal at the high school level, for instance. Could you talk about that, please? Yes, I believe Dr. Worley is ready to make a few comments on that tonight because obviously at, at elementary school, students do come in classrooms of about 25 students or 20 to 25 and they remain in the same classroom all day but the high school is very very different when it comes to the types of programs that we have to offer with regard to choice. Dr. Worley, do you want to make a few comments on that please? Yes ma'am. Good evening um, Dr. Heron and Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, for high school, obviously, um, as Dr. Hammer was saying, each class doesn't come necessarily in a group of 20 to 25 in each room. We have lots of different programs in our, in our high schools, lots of different initiatives. We have some class sizes that are larger for programs, especially within uh, uh, the music, arts, theater. We also have our innovative spaces, which we are having to make adjustments the past couple of years in our high schools to make space for the creativity, for the collaboration, for the, the students working in groups, um, building things and creating their presentations. And we just can't predict also, <clears throat> pardon me, for each um, classroom what size they will, that it will be based upon what the course is. Um, a lot of times the students, our courses are change each year based upon a course request, but um, Obviously, when we want to spread out for teachers also to collaborate, but also spaces for students to work, they're not always compact. Um, right now, in most of the high schools, um, most of the rooms are being utilized every period of every day. Teachers do not have their own um, classroom, per se, to plan in. They have workspaces that they go to, um, department offices or collaborative workspaces, but they are almost every classroom most hours of the day are, are utilized. So it's not like we have an empty room anywhere. And we noticed that makes uh, um, the last six years as a high school principal, that often made master scheduling quite difficult when there was no room for flexibility in the schedule because there's not spaces available. Yes. Um, this kind of is a question that deals with our last meeting when the um, we had a public commentary about um, smaller uh, some like for Lafayette for example where you have AP classes that don't make because they don't have the the number of students um, so you're talking about class sizes that uh, I would if we're not doing redistricting and we're trying to accommodate some of the um, the student issues related to uh, AP courses that don't make that maybe they should make at a lower level which would be taking up a classroom with less children uh, or less students um, it, it's another thing that we should be considering when we talk about capacity because um, if we're talking about um, 
fairness for those college-bound, college prep students. It's important for them to, to have access, and so maybe the school class sizes aren't going to be at 15 to 35 students in a class to make, make our high schools equitable. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out as something that we should be considering when we're talking about capacity and classroom sizes. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Rowley. I, I just have a question. Last year we received information. Uh, we, they did a period-by-period um, period study of uh, classroom utilization. And I, and I th thought I remember that at, at Lafayette, there were, there were classrooms that were not being utilized. I don't have that information right in front of me. I could get that. Um, I'm sure, I know from my recollection, specifically with Jamestown, we had a few rooms that were not utilized, but I do not know from the top of my hand each high school what, what that report was. But I know that across the board, as we worked on our master schedules, it was difficult to, sometimes the space impacted the schedule, not just even the request. We'd have a teacher available, but not a space for the teacher. So I can definitely get that information for you. Yeah, I mean... Because we're, we're asking the community to uh, put money into expansion, and I think it would be um, important to find out just what, what we're really talking about when it comes to those classrooms. If, if all the classrooms, like you said, are being utilized, and I do understand the difficulty of master schedules, but it, I think I would like that if we could somehow check it out, at least Lafayette for sure, because I do, it did seem to me that Warhill and Jamestown were pretty full. But if you could, if you could find some time to just check into Lafayette for me, please. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to thank the staff for all the hard work, diligent work for presenting the CIP, and I think the struggle is real with wants and needs, and I think that as a division we do a really good job of identifying our needs. Um, and I, I know that we are a premier school division, and, and we are lucky that teachers from across the nation continue to want to come and, and teach in our schools, and families um, often who are transient or moving here, military families, choose to come to Williamsburg, James City County because of our schools. And I know our neighbor, York County, has approximately the same number of students that we do, and they have three additional buildings. So I don't think that our um, CIP is unrealistic um, by any stretch of the imagination. And so I just want to echo again and, and thank staff for all the hard work of, of pulling together this CIP and helping us understand it and understand the numbers and helping the community understand um, that we truly have needs. Um, yeah, I, I would like to echo Ms. Ombi's thanks of, of stuff. This is a process that you know starts, it's a very long process and it's comprehensive and it's building year over year and uh, it's inclusive of community members and of our localities and of staff within the division and, it, and it's informed by you know, staff and building leadership and the facility uh, index, uh, conditions index. I hope we're going to commission another one of those soon because that's getting a little old. But, um, you know, I, I, I would like to talk a little bit about the new elementary and the high school uh, additions. I, I support the CIP as it's currently presented. Um, I, I, we need a new elementary school uh, today. Uh, we are we have a, we have a trailer already in, at the elementary school level. We are seeking another. I think we are going to seek more ultimately before we open another elementary school. What's driving my um, thinking about elementary school in addition to existing capacity is keeping in mind that after the recession, we actually increased class size at the at the elementary school level, and we haven't been able yet to undo that. Um, I don't think. We did that, we took that decision as a division lightly, and I think we hoped that it would be temporary. Um, and I think we hear from the Education Association and teachers all the time that class size matters. And so if we're able to ever go back to the way it was pre-recession to that smaller classroom, there is no doubt we will need more um, 
so any doubt with projections, currently right now we have uh, more children in each classroom and when we have the resources to, to alleviate that, we're going to absolutely need that space. So I support the new elementary uh, school request wholeheartedly. Um, the high school additions, uh, particularly um, the, um, the starting with Warhill, uh, next year asking for design and then uh, and then funding the additions and the, and the auxiliary gym. I think the parents have been clear that the auxiliary gym is needed at that school and I hope that they uh, take the message beyond us to the funding bodies uh, as they uh, you know, continue to advocate that. I think um, adding a couple hundred students at each uh, building is cheaper than opening a new high school. I think the enrollment projections suggest that that is the more um, prudent way to move forward at this time, although I agree with Mr. Kelly, ultimately additional high school will absolutely be needed. Um, for now, I think additions are the way to go and to start with Warhell because of its location and it's uh, so closely located to a built environment and infrastructure including transportation and the, um, and the community college and to move the, some of the programs that are currently housed at Lafayette to over to that school to allow those students who need uh, a slightly different uh, high school experience to take advantage of the nearby uh, community college. So um, I just would like to applaud staff for both their you know, thoughtful and prudent approach to, um, you know, to both additions. And, and in one case, it resulted in recommending a new school. And in another case, it actually recommended additions. And I think looking at it uh, critically at each level uh, should be applauded. So. Um, Anyway, does anyone have anything to add to that? The only thing I'd like to add to your comment about the elementary school, um, I, as I mentioned at the last meeting, I'm, I'm not sure if the design in fiscal year 20 isn't, isn't too early because we don't have a site that's been identified. And you, I think you'd kind of like to do the design around the site that you have. But um, your point is well taken about uh, increasing, increasing class sizes. Uh, but the other thing, the other factor to consider there is we also took away teacher assistance at the at the early level, um, early levels, and that and that has also had an effect. So not only have we added more students to um, the elementary classrooms, we've also taken away that, that teacher assistant, which is kind of the double whammy. So um, I, I certainly support the elementary school and the, and the expansions as we as we talked about last week. So. I also support the elementary school um, addition. You know to build another elementary school. I uh, also support the War Hill uh, going first. I would like us to um, perhaps look uh, next year or the following year at our uh, attendance numbers and then I don't want to totally write off a redistricting at the high school level if it saves a lot of money and can balance our schools. So, just want to put that out there. Anything else? Dr. Heron, is there anything that we left out or anything that you'd like to add? I don't think so. Just following from Mrs. Hummel's comment, obviously we're voting, uh, when we bring this to the board to vote it, they vote just on the next year. And so there is an opportunity to look at the enrollment every single year and make adjustments as we feel are prudent and necessary. Okay. If there's nothing else, that moves us to board member comments and requests. Mr. Kelly? Um, just uh, as we approach the end of the end of this calendar year and uh, students get ready for the uh, for the, that big break to just maintain their focus and uh, and uh, stay safe in that break. So. I guess I just would echo what Mr. Kelly said because I'm, as we're going into the winter season, roads are going to be icier. I'd sure like everyone to be safe. Mrs. Taylor? Um, it was a very encouraging evening, um, which I enjoyed our recognitions of our students and the JVB spotlight and the presentation from New Horizons talking about all the wonderful programming offered to our students. Um, Ms. Hummel? I just wanted to remind everyone to come to the, the holiday parade in Williamsburg at 9 o'clock on Saturday, and it's not going to rain. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> That's it. So, 
Tombi. I was very excited to hear about the text messaging. That's so cool. <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't wait to get my first text message. What, the, the school's going to be stopped because and of snow? And it's easy. It's easy. Like, I don't have to do anything. You're going to send me a text message, and then I just say yes. I want to be in that. Thank the communications department. I'll do it. Wait. So, since we last met, several of us um, attended, all of us, no, yeah, several of us, most of us t attended Virginia School Boards Association annual conference, which we're very lucky takes place uh, in Williamsburg, which saves the division a lot of money, right? Yes. Because we get to just, we don't have to. Uh, travel and uh, so uh, you know I think we all learn a lot there and uh, very grateful for the professional development opportunities we have in this state and nationally for school boards um, and not every not everyone has that so we're lucky and and, uh, and I also just want to encourage citizens to please weigh in on the um, both the CIP uh, we had two public hearings but um, that we'll adopt next meeting but then it goes through a process with the locality so please Please keep commenting, um, you know, whether you support it or don't, it's important to hear um, what you have to think, and, and your comments always encourage us to ask better questions. So we appreciate that, and I would add, add the same thing for the operating budget. That's coming up at, at the beginning of next year, and so stay tuned for that, and please uh, engage in that, because together we collectively make better decisions with citizen input. So we appreciate that very much. Anything else? All right, that brings us to upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Um, in room 309, the policy committee is meeting. Um, tomorrow afternoon at 3.30, the student advisory committee meeting is at the Laf at Lafayette High School Media Center. And then on the 29th uh, at 7.30 a.m., the school liaison committee is meeting at the Room 309 in the annex at the school board and central mm -hmm. office. Quick correction yeah. to the student advisory. Yeah. It's at 3. It's at not three thirty. It's at three. And is it at three? Yes. And um, SEAC has scheduled a December twelfth meeting, which will be held um, in the annex building, room one hundred eight. They typically don't hold a December meeting, but um, September <coughs> and October were hurricaned out, so they've only met once this year. Thank you for adding that. All right. No, any other upcoming events? That will move to upcoming meetings. Um, we have a joint meeting on December sixth in the Stryker Center here in room uh, 127. And then on December 11th, we will have our only meeting in December. It starts at 6 p.m. No, it starts at 5.15, yes, in uh, the annex at the School Board and Central Office. That's a closed session. And then the work session and action items will start at 6.30 in room 300 in the annex. And then we will begin the new year for our organizational meeting on the 8th of January at 6 p.m., also in the annex, followed by um, the organizational meeting work session at 6.30. And um, because December is our, we only have one meeting, uh, the action item um, that is on the agenda that I know of right now is the CIP, and Ms. Serza did send me an email with the other items, but I didn't have a time to digest it, so stay tuned for what's on that agenda, but we know that um, the CIP will be on that. So is there anything else I'm meeting, missing, Ms. Serza or Dr. Heron? It's, that's fine. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned.